I'm going to turn the proceedings over to Arlene <coughs> Rivera Finkelstein, who is the Assistant Dean and Executive Director of the Public Interest Center at Penn Law. And she's going to take us through the next panel, which is on putting cameras in the hands of clients. Arlene. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Austin, and thanks for including me in today's presentation. Um, I'm happy to be with you, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you the next panelists who are going to um, be talking to you about literally arming, arming our clients uh, with uh, uh, tools to, to share their voice. Um, and then, uh, although neither is in the legal setting, we'll be able to talk about it in their settings and then come back to talking about how that might, um, might be transferable to the legal setting and talk about some of the pitfalls that we might encounter and the benefits that could be encountered from that use. Um, and then we'll be more than happy to take everybody's questions about this. So to start the discussion, um, let me introduce them both to you and then we'll let, uh, I've been told not to call them doctors, but we'll let the doctors take over the conversation. <laughs> um, so for, uh, we have Dr. Gretchen Berland here from Yale Medical School, uh, producer and director of the documentary Rolling, Life in a Wheelchair, and Dr. Carolyn Canusio, Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, um, who will be uh, commenting on, uh, on uh, Dr. Berland's work. So thank you. And now I, I, I broke the rule and I called you doctor and I apologize. So um, here's Gretchen Berland. Um, good morning. I guess I'll leave my notes here. Uh, I want to thank Professor Austin and everyone, the Documentary and Law Project, for inviting me down. And thank you all for coming on a Friday morning. I know that, um, at least in any discipline's life, time is of the essence. So, um, oh, okay, here we go. Uh, so I appreciate you coming out and spending time today listening to what I do. Um, I, we have an hour and a half, and so I, I think, as um, I said earlier, I want to make this session uh, helpful for you, hopefully, and if you have questions about what I do. But I will start by just giving you a little bit of background about uh, why I think Regina invited me to this talk. I'm a, a physician now, but um, before I went to medical school, I actually was a producer for Nova and McNeil Lair. And I did that for a number of years. I mostly produced science documentaries. Um, and, uh, and then in the late 1980s, um, when the healthcare crisis sort of started to heat back up again, um, McNeil Lair decided to produce a five part series on um, sort of the crisis in healthcare, none of which has changed. And, um, and, and I was sort of a traditional documentary producer, if you can define traditional documentaries in the sense that you shoot with a film crew, you have a treatment, you edit it, and it airs on television. And uh, then, for better or for worse, I, um, I, uh, I put that career aside and um, uh, went to medical school. And I really had thought that when I was going to go to medical school that I had no interest in combining the two careers. I had no interest in being a TV doctor. Can you hear me? Okay, I just want to make sure. My mother says I have a voice of a 12-year-old, so I just want to <laughs> make sure you can hear me. Um, and uh, I really thought that I was going to put my life in television away. And, um, and it, uh, because I just didn't, I felt that the craft of becoming a physician was something that required time and effort and focus. And uh, then in my third year of medical school, I was on uh, my child psychiatry uh, clerkship rotation. And I guess it must be... Uh, karma, um, my rotation took us to the Juvenile Justice Center in Portland, Oregon, which is where I went to medical school. And there with the child psychiatrist, it was our responsibility to interview teens who had been recently incarcerated in the juvenile justice system and to look for potentially any, quote, reversible metabolic disorders that, that would have led to the behavior that incarcerated them there. And uh, um, the first thing we got was uh, a folder, a file, the intake file. You got the name and the age of the client, and then there was a series of open-ended questions um, uh, that they had asked of the clients. Um, uh, what are you uh, most afraid of? Um, where do you want to be five years from now? Um, sort of a series of relatively um, um, 
in theory, probing questions. And the answers were very, very linear and very fatalistic. Many of them wrote that five years from now they thought they would be dead. And uh, so you begin to, at least I did at that time, you begin to form an impression of who this person was from that file. And, um, and it seemed to me very one-dimensional. And, um, and then we went in and we interviewed these young people. And I was just struck by the incredible discordance between how the system perceived them and what they were talking about impacted their lives. And, and I don't know if any of you have you been to Portland, Oregon, but the Juvenile Justice Center is very, very lavish. Um, they have a lot of money, and I just thought, um, and many of them were talking about they had committed very violent crimes simply because they'd been disrespected. So I got an idea to, um, I thought, huh, you know, it just didn't seem to me that we knew anything about who these young individuals were. So I got a small grant, and I gave cameras to five teens who had been incarcerated in the juvenile justice system and um, set about seeing whether or not what, what would they find out about their lives um, if you gave them the opportunity. And that's how I sort of ended up here 13 years later. And what I found was what they shot, it was a wildly ambitious project, um, I would say largely a failure because I didn't spend enough time in the field. But what they shot was really interesting. And um, it was very different than what I had seen as a television producer. The footage was disjointed, it was clunky, it was really, really, really rocky. So you almost had to take uh, Fanergan <laughs> when you were watching it. But every, every now and then, there were these sort of snippets of, of these individuals who it seemed like the system never, ever saw. Great vulnerability, um, uh, just moments where you thought, oh my gosh, you know, these are, these are experiences that they're showing you that the system has no idea exist. And, and I sort of, that was the thing I sort of learned most from the project, that if you give a camera to someone and you give it to them for enough period of time, it's really quite interesting. And then I went on to my residency, and so I had to put that part of my life away. Um, and I did another project in residency where I gave cameras on call to my colleagues to use as a video diary during their first week of training. And um, it's called Cross Cover, and uh, it got me into a lot of trouble. Oh. <laughs> um, because the establishment was very uncomfortable with residents talking about, for the most part, experiences that we all know. Um, and uh, and then and then fast forward to now, uh, when I um, then went and did a Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars, which is a, a two-year fellowship for basically for physicians who sort of who want to do something with the world but aren't don't want to go into a lab. And um, rolling got started um, really by accident. Um, I was in California in San Diego at a meeting on the quality of care at a Marriott. And um, it was a two-day session, and largely um, uh, speeches, PowerPoint-driven, and there was one woman there in a power wheelchair. And I watched her for two days. And I watched her navigate the physical surroundings, and I watched how the audience interacted with her. I watched how long it took for her to roll from um, uh, the back of um, a conference room to the microphone, I watched how the audience responded to her when it took 30 seconds for them to lower the microphone so she could speak, and I just sort of thought, huh, it was just a little bit of a light bulb. I thought, you know what, it would just be very interesting if you put the camera in the hands of someone whose, whose worldview, for the most part, is, is from four feet. So that was back in 2001, and I, um, I built basically three cameras for, um, and found three people in Los Angeles, in the greater Los Angeles community. Um, and what we initially thought was going to be a six-week qualitative mm -hmm. research project, where I thought all we were going to do was sort of film the objective processes of living in a wheelchair, um, rolled into this six-year collaborative participatory-based project. And... Um, and so I think of what I'm going to do today is talk with you, show you some clips, and then talk with you about how this film got made and, and where it's ended up. It's, um, it's in terms of how I made the film, it's very different than traditional documentary filmmaking in terms of collecting the information. How I looked at the, the material is very different. So um, do people have questions now? 
Do you want to see the footage? Okay. So let me, let me show you. Um, there are three people. Each of them took the camera for two years. Um, uh, they came from very disparate backgrounds. I, um, I did not intentionally select them on the basis of uh, socioeconomic status, health insurance status, medical condition, partly because, um, you know, unlike a survey or a random digit dial where you can call someone up and say, hey, you get to take a camera for two years, it, it, usually it's a fair amount of commitment on someone's part. So um, first I'm going to show you some footage shown by uh, Ernie Wallengren. Ernie, each of them shot about 70 hours worth of material over two years, which is a phenomenal amount of footage. Um, and uh, I'm going to show some clips um, and then uh, talk about um, why these are important clips and why, if you put a, why I think it demonstrates if you, the difference between bringing a professional cameraman or camera person to come and shoot an experience versus what happens when you put a camera in the hands of the subject that you're interested in studying. Um, so. This is Ernie Wallengren. He, uh, when he filmed this, he was 52 years old. The boredom. Boy, is that a mainstay of life with ALS. I got bored when I could still walk. This is gonna, this is gonna suck. She inflicted on, any, on anybody else. But this is a tape about what it's like to have ALS, what it's like to live in a wheelchair, what it's like to live inside the walls of my house. With a son who plays the drums. So, uh, we can keep the lights off, we'll keep moving. So Ernie, as you can all tell, um, as you will see, uh, really used, throughout most of his material, used humor as sort of a foil to keep uh, keep largely his family at bay, but this is this gives you, I think that piece is one, it's, um, it's very accessible, he's very humorous, but you also begin to sort of see the texture of what the visual medium can do. It can sort of allow you in to see dimensions and tone and understand experience um, in a way that some of the other methods that we currently have usually, at least in qualitative health research, to study a person's experience. And then I'm um, just to show you another one. Um, this is a uh, this is filmed right around the same time, and um, these are all clips. This, this has all been intercut into a, a, a larger documentary which aired on PBS this year, but. Ernie, this is one of the first scenes that Ernie filmed, and it's significant for a number of reasons, but I want to show it to you first. It really kind of gives you an example of, of how a camera can show you very small details of a person's life that you can't normally get with really any other data collection tool. All right, maybe I should talk a little bit about exactly what my particular handicap is. I'm on my way to becoming a full-fledged quadriplegic, they tell me. I have uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. It started in my legs and has gradually progressed to other areas of my body. My hands, I, I have a hard time manipulating small objects but in my shoulder. My speech is starting to thicken too. And I to say that eventually my speech will be, a, be quite profoundly affected. Um, it's considered an inevitably fatal neural degenerative disease, although uh, only in, in cases where people choose not to have mechanical ventilatory support. I have not yet made that decision. Uh, I go back and forth about it quite a bit. Now, 
To me, this is actually one of my favorite scenes of all the 212 hours um, mm. because it's it's such a it's such it's so simply elegant. You hear, you see the blue cup, you see how much work it takes for him. What was what was six months ago something he walked into his kitchen um, and did in a matter of 30 seconds now takes him minutes, and so. Um, in the end, this, this, Ernie did this with a number of things, sort of the, you know, this sort of in qualifies as an objective process of daily life, but um, this was an example of sort of how rich the visual medium can kind of take you into someone's life, and it's, it's, it's a very simple scene. He's making Carnation instant breakfast, and I've now seen that refrigerator, I don't know how many thousand times. I, I know where the Christmas fruitcake is, and, um, <laughs> where the wine, port wine cheese is, but you know, you hear how much work it takes for him just to lift that gallon of milk and put it back up into the refrigerator. Um, and, and this became, over time, um, you know, taken as a, as a simple scene um, without any context. You think, well, it's just a guy making instant carnation instant breakfast. But um, Ernie, Ernie was diagnosed with ALS, and um, the arc of his story and the arc of what he filmed largely had to do with changes in terms of how physical illness impacts living independently and functional status. And so this, this, one of this, this scene here became largely kind of a metaphor for many of the other things that he was going to have to go through in his life, both physically but also emotionally, um, as, as a father um, and also in terms of how his family. But so this is just sort of one scene where you're really kind of in that wheelchair, and you're you're really kind of feeling as close as you can to what it took for him to make a meal. Now, if I had been there with a camera crew and filmed him every day for two years, you wouldn't have gotten this image. You wouldn't have gotten this POV. Um, so then I want to show you one more clip. Um, if you do watch the film, and um, I'll talk about that a little bit later today. Ernie, on uh, one hand, was a kind of a master comic. He was a he was a writer for a um, uh, very very famous television writer. He was a producer. He was executive producer for Falcon's Crest, which he often doesn't like to talk about <laughs> first. But um, Walton's, and so he was very very talented. And as you can tell, he was sort of a master comedian. And he used comedian comedy or humor as sort of a foil to keep people back dealing with very intimate issues around decisions of life and death. And Ernie only used, um, and this is also something that I found that was very interesting, the three participants used the cameras in very different ways, and that evolved over time. Um, and each of them used it as a confidant, but Ernie in particular was only really, um, uh, really sort of let his guard down and talked about very difficult issues related to his illness in the bathroom. Mm. He would turn the camera on in the bathroom, and um, he did this about ten times um, during his footage, and talked about some major other decisions. This, in any other scene outside with the family, um, he he never did this. So I just want to <coughs> show you this one scene here. Last night, though, I, in the middle of the night, I had to go to the bathroom. I had a very hard time getting out of bed. Cheryl, my wife ended up helping me get to my feet. It took me a while to get into the wheelchair, make it into the bathroom, stand up, use the toilet, get back in the chair, return to bed, climb out of the chair, get my legs lifted up onto the bed. And after going through the whole thing, I, I turned over to Cheryl and and said, I just didn't know how much more of this I could take. It, you know, it's hard for me to kind of plan things in the future. I'd like to take the basketball team to a, to a tournament in Las Vegas at the end of March. Uh, and it, that still is my intention. But it's now January. I look back two months. And in the last two months, I've lost quite a bit. In the next two months, how much more will I, will I lose? So, you know, this was, um, you know, you can almost sort of, we can, we'll turn the lights on for a little bit and we'll turn them back down. Um, er, Ernie's, and I think this is um, particularly in chronic illness, and I'm 
clearly I have a bias because I'm speaking to you as a physician, but you know the balance between um, independence and dignity and um, burden and autonomy and identity is it's 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 a pendulum that everyone has to deal with and that was sort of Ernie's major theme in a lot of the footage that he filmed and um, uh, this was an issue that is in the arc of the film now um, but I'm going to move on to the next person but just to give you a sense of what we did with all this footage um, uh, normally in a documentary film you go in and you shoot the footage and you have them sign an appearance release and um, and then depending on your relationship with the subject uh, you never see them again um, you let them know when it is it might be airing if you have a collegial relationship and if you don't have a collegial relationship well then they may or may not know um, but this was a very different this was very participatory in nature so when I first gave them the cameras um, Part of the relationship was that they owned the camera, that they that they had editorial control over what they filmed, that they got to decide at any step in the process that if the footage they filmed was something that they wanted not to be shown, they had that right to do that. That was one sort of ground rule that we made. Another thing that I did with each of the participants, particularly for Ernie, is that during the two years that we were filming together, I went out and basically spent one or I spent basically I was a participant observer. I hung out with them for one or two days and just either hanging out kind of with them in their lives or we um, also we sat down um, and this was no small task. Um, we sat down and we screened all the rushes together. So I put a wireless microphone on them and I sat with them in their house and we watched everything in real time. Um, uh, what they shot and talked about what they shot. And um, that was an enormously helpful um, uh, pro aspect of the project that I sort of did accidentally. But it allowed me to see another layer into the footage that I hadn't really seen before. And oftentimes things that, assumptions that I made about um, footage were naive. And so it lent yet kind of another layer to the t texture and dimension of the project. So Ernie in particular, we would sit and um, I'd, we would talk about um, the, um, the different scenes. Um, it became harder because he lost his voice over time. But now I'm going to move on to the questions, comments. This, sir? Can you give us an idea what ALS is? Lou Gehrig's disease. How does it Well, um, it, it usually has a, um, it, it, it's a, it's a um, upper motor neuron disease, so patients um, usually present with weakness and a gait abnormality, and then eventually you have um, sort of paralysis of the upper body and lower body, and you lose all abilities, basically all voluntary motion. You can't breathe, you can't eat. The average lifespan is 18 months. Ernie died um, in the film. He died 18 months into filming. So, um, you know, I think there are, many, there are many horrendous illnesses that you could wish on a person in this world, but I think ALS ranks up there in the top. So Ernie had, had, Ernie had been in a wheelchair a year when we started filming, and at the time when he started filming, he could clip a wireless mic on, he could operate a video camera. Because he came from a television background, he had the most elaborate camera package mm -hmm. of anyone, but... Um, but ALS is a devastating condition. He had the richest health insurance benefits package of any of the three, and it was just by accident. But even then, there were issues related to decisions in his life and what he wanted to do that um, that no health insurance system could really help. So does that answer your question? Yeah? What was the shot on camera? What kind of it was a Sony PC-110, which is now, of course, completely outdated. But um, because the consumer camcorder world has evolved, um, you know, I think that the camera, the camera makers realize that there's a big market in the kind of low end of the camcorders. So I think now you could do a Canon HD 30. Even mini DV tapes are going away. Um, so we took at the time uh, sort of the high end camcorder, Sony PC 110, and I put a wide angle lens on it. Um, I built a kit for each of them. Um, I put a, a got a wireless mic. I got a little omnidirectional mic um, because the audio on the camcorders, for the most part, is like a chiclet. It's horrible sound, 
And in some ways, the eye is very forgiving. You can watch a very distorted image, mm -hmm. but you cannot, um, uh, you can't handle bad sound. Humans can't tolerate bad sound. You can put up with poor image, but not a, not mm -hmm. a lousy audio. Um, and that's something I learned the hard way. Um, so, and then each of them over time, we built, we built, um, put together a number of spider tripods and uh, um, depending on kind of what, what they wanted to film and what their living situation was like. For instance, um, one of the other participants who you'll see lived alone, so it meant that if she wanted to film or negotiate something, we had to kind of accommodate that. So Ernie had two cameras, PC-110s, unlimited tape, um, unlimited batteries, and unlimited editorial control even though in the end it was not an issue. I think the more control you give someone, the less likely they're going to say you can't do this, which is also a piece of it. Yeah, Margie. I'm curious, PBS is so particular about their standards. Did that come into play when you were discussing? No, I online this and mixed it and sort of did it all the, you know, um, traditional way. So it didn't, it came into play in terms of expletives. So, um, you know, they, um, we had to edit out any of the expletives, um, which is unfortunate because um, some of the expletives sort of really lend themselves to sort of understanding the context. But that was the only issues we had with them. Yeah. I wonder if you could give an example before you said um, when you rewatched the scenes with them mm -hmm. and they were sort of I was narrating it for mm -hmm. you, telling you it made you realize that your initial take mm -hmm. was naive. Mm -hmm. Can you give an Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. Um, there was a scene, uh, it's not in here, uh, because uh, you don't want to sit through 212 hours of footage. Um, there was a scene where Ernie is a bas was a basketball coach, and uh, it, it, it's normal, if you were to take a camera and film your own life, you would find that you would film your hobbies probably 30 or 40 percent of the time. So Ernie, Ernie filmed a lot of basketball practices, a lot of basketball games. So there was... Um, uh, one one scene, it's not in the film, but where he went to basketball practice and nobody came up to him. He was, you know, sort of at the court alone um, for 15 or 20 minutes. And I thought, you know, look, having read all the disability literature and thinking about sort of isolation and avoidance, I thought, oh, you know, um, his, you know, his his colleagues are changing how they interact with him because he's in a wheelchair now and he's being ignored. And then I showed that to Ernie. He was like, no, they weren't. You know, they're out getting hot dogs and they were coming back to get me. So, <laughs> so you know, I just sort of, I, you know, you can look at footage and, and make very different assumptions on what you see without context. Um, you know, that said, there were times when we each interpreted some scenes a little differently than others or... Um, when audiences um, interpreted um, scenes without context, that was v very interesting mm -hmm. in the next um, person I'll talk about. But but it wasn't so much partly mm -hmm. because um, we kind of we both myself and the participant immersed ourselves in kind of understanding their lives, and I think that over time um, I couldn't have done this if it had been in a six week period of time, and that was a lesson that I learned the hard way from my first project. I needed more time to really understand all the layers and complexity of kind of who a person was and the dimensions of a person's experience. Um, you know, medicine turns to define things partly because of the, there's such an emphasis on quantitative research as black and white, on and off. You know, you're, you're disabled or you're not, or you're sick or you're not. Well, you can be sick some days and not. And, and so, that kind of ebb and flow took me time to realize that that existed, and it took us time to sort of figure out, and the, if that makes sense. Other questions? Yeah. Um, did Arnie, was the camera for Arnie, was it mounted on his wheelchair, and he, did he have, have a viewfinder? He we did, that's a great question. So the Sony PC-110s, one thing we did was, um, you know, that's the other thing, is that a lot of these camcorders, they're, they're, they're built for, um, I don't know who they're built for, but if you have any, um, if you have any arthritis or any difficulties with your hands, they're just little teeny hand operating things. They're horrible. Um, but so we, so the, the Sony PC-110 had a viewfinder. We took um, Bogut or Manfrotto, you know, they built, they built a lot of arms 
And first we took, um, so we built a, a arm camera arm mount that basically, for in the each had um, three different types of wheelchairs that sort of basically built at their eye level. And then I put a, um, a pan tilt tripod so they could flip the camera around 360 so that they could turn the camera on them if they wanted to film when they were shooting or flip it back around. And then I each uh, outfitted them with the neck strap so if they wanted to wear the camera and not operate the tripod so if they were rolling forward they could do that. Um, and, uh, and then um, Galen would put the camera in his lap. Each of them sort of used it in different ways. So I did. I built an arm. And there was, no, there was sort of no arm for, for the disabled out there. So I went to a number of camera stores. And, and then it took us like seven, seven iterations to sort of get it right for each of them because, you know, part of it was um, safety. You know, clearly you're not in a wheelchair by choice. Each of them had very different neurological conditions. Each of them lived in different physical surroundings. So, but the viewfinder was incredibly helpful because it allowed them to sort of see what they were doing, and um, and they also got they kind of got immediate real time um, feedback in terms of what they were shooting. I think if I were doing it again, I would probably um, or when I do it again, I'd use the Canon HD30 because Canon at that time Sony gave you kind of a better. Um, a better picture a little bit with the camcorders but the just the way Canon is designed in terms of operating um, Sony you had to turn it like a dial and there were these just sort of minute little changes that we couldn't do but Canon is more like a um, it rolls so that's easier to do um, if you're operating it and there's less room for error but you know it was they're they're still imperfect. They're better, but imperfect. And I I couldn't use something like you're using because it would be too big for them to operate. So that's what we did. Other questions? Okay. Um, let me move on to the second person, Galen Buckwalter. If you um, Galen Buckwalter was the first person who agreed to take the video camera. I don't think he knew what he was getting into, and I don't think I knew what I was getting into. Um, Galen is a statistician by trade. Um, he's now the vice president of eHarmony. We wrote about our experiences after the film came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, which I think is how Regina Austin learned about my work. Um, when I met Galen, Galen had been in a wheelchair for 30 years. Um, uh, he uh, sustained a spinal cord injury from a diving accident in, in the Susquehanna River a long time ago. and um, and it became clear over time that, that the arc of kind of Galen's narrative and experience was largely about identity. And for each of them, it was about identity. But how do you, how do you um, uh, kind of live your life if you can't feel from basically your neck down? And what does it mean to be a person? These were consistent sort of themes in what he filmed. Um, he also took his camera to the doctor's office, which... Um, we write about, and um, this is one scene uh, where he's been, he's, uh, at this point he's been waiting in the doctor's office for 40, almost 40 minutes. This is Galen. Waiting in doctor's offices and hospital waiting rooms and hospital hallways. I have a whole lot of time to spend. My injury occurred in the dark ages of rehabilitation medicine. At the Elizabethtown Crippled Children's Hospital, I had been in traction for three months, when in the middle of the night, the tongs ripped down on my head. The doctors took me to the operating room to stabilize my neck. They gave me a local anesthetic and started placing four bolts in my skull for the metal halo. The pain was excruciating. I pleaded. I screamed. I eventually hallucinated. Later that night, one of the doctors came and apologized. He checked the date on the anesthetic. It had expired years ago. Man. Hey, Mr. Buckwalter. Howdy. 
How's it going? What's going on with your shoulders? Um, nice to see you. They're, I don't know. They're kind of blowing out on me. What do you mean? Seems, um, for sure. like for, I would say like three or four months, there's been noticeable, you know, pain. Can you touch the back of your head? Both of them. How about, can you put them behind you like this? Just to give it a, okay. Does that make it hurt when yeah. you do those things? Yeah. You might have what we call a chromial clavicular strain. There's a ligament that binds the acromial notch with your clavicle, which attaches here. As far as giving you some advice on how not to use the shoulder. Yeah, I know. It's like, do I not do anything or do well, I? But you have to. Yeah, I have how to else do I transfer? So. Yeah. Really, yeah. your arms are your legs, too. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they are. Okay, let me give that to you. Do you need some help with the camera? Got that. If the pain in my shoulders gets worse, it's going to be harder for me to use a manual wheelchair. My current choices are to get a power chair or start thinking about having my shoulders surgically replaced. So then, um, about 11 days later, um, Galen's shoulders were a, a significant issue in terms of his... Oh, lights, okay. Um, in terms of his independence, it was a big issue for him over time. If you've been in a manual wheelchair for 30 years, if you know anybody who's been in a manual wheelchair for 30 years, you know that um, the wear and tear that um, you have to sort of deal with on a day-to-day -day basis really can destroy your shoulders. This was a huge issue for him. Um, and, and yet, um, and he writes about the scene, the scene makes him incredibly uncomfortable because he really cannot stand how he interacts with his doctor. Um, and so then at home, um, uh, 10 days later, this is at his kitchen table because his, his choices that he faces in terms of his shoulders really are very limited. He can either have his shoulders surgically replaced, which is a huge, huge loss of independence. It means a lot of time down. He can tr uh, transition to a power wheelchair, which again for him is, was another symbolic loss of independence. And um, it meant a whole lot of issues in terms of changing his identity. Um, and it was just a huge struggle that would not have been apparent again if I hadn't spent more time with him. And, um, and yet, uh, um, so then, and then, so this is sort of, uh, this is 11 days later in his kitchen, sort of talking about the same thing he talked about with his physician. You know, I realize just how freaking much my shoulders are hurting and how they're so crucial to everything that I do. I don't know if it makes any sense, but I have always envisioned myself as, you know, as a, as a proud gimp. But I'm so... so blessed by, uh, by what I've been able to experience in life. And uh, nothing can take that away. But, uh, but my blessings don't don't stop it from hurting. Um, different um, context as to him discussing what's going on with his shoulders at home in the kitchen as compared to his exchange with his physician. Um, you could argue, can you ever create an exam room where you can have that intimate discussion where a patient can really disclose that much? But it's pretty clear, and if you look at any, any of the literature in terms of how, for the most part, we take care of patients, we do largely a horrendous job. Um, and it's not just the sterility of the room, it, it's the casualness of sort of often the encounters and 
Galen's physician, while he wasn't neglectful in any way, shape, or form, was very casual. And the casualness cost um, cost the physician and Galen the opportunity to talk about sort of what the choices he was going to have to face with his shoulders. Um, and it was just the huge sort of, for him, you know, each person has a pendulum between independence, autonomy, burden, loss of independence, and each of them sort of filmed that over two years. And this is one, one I would recommend you look at the piece in New England Journal of Medicine because it's very interesting at how really upset Galen is about his inability to talk about his pain with his physician um, and how using the camera has helped him change how he talks with his, with his doctors now. So I saved the most controversial um, participant for last. Um, and uh, I'll transition to this partly because I think her footage is um, most the most powerful and the, the rawest of the, the, the three subjects. Um, she was the, a woman who participated in this project. Her name is Vicki Elman. When I first met her, she was 50, and she had had MS for over 20 years, relapsing, remitting, multiple sclerosis, and had been in a power wheelchair for eight years. If any of you are familiar with San, uh, Los Angeles, she used to work as a business manager for um, the Department of Plastic Surgery at UCLA. Um, Los Angeles is a little bit like New York City. The closer you are to UCLA and West LA and the beach, that's sort of like Greenwich Village. And the farther you move east um, towards Palm Springs, uh, the more it becomes sort of the boroughs. Vicki was once working and functional and as a result of her illness over time because of income changes moved basically 45 miles east of LA in a city called San Dimas and UCLA in its um, uh, uh, I would say calculated wisdom decided that they put uh, uh, basically a limit if you lived 40 miles outside of the city limits they would no longer take care of you. Um, so when I met Vicki she had been uh, followed by UCA neurologist, but because of where she lived, she was in a capitated Medicare HMO plan and followed by physicians in San Dimas. And um, as I was telling Carolyn, when you first meet Vicki, um, you're not going to see her face until a fairly extreme scene. Um, I really had the perception that she would film the most least interesting material. Um, her, When you walk into her house, there are um, it's messy. She lives alone. She has a hard time keeping it clean. It took us months to reach her by telephone for a variety of reasons. And, um, and so I just, I wasn't sure what she was going to film. I thought she was going to be sort of in terms of trying to get it to understand what her life was like, um, the most difficult. And she was referred to me because she had lived alone and really had valued her independence at sometimes it, in situations where it may have put her at risk. But that said, she, she's raised her two-year-old daughter who's now a medical student alone. She was, she's incredibly resilient. Um, but it became clear that, um, that, that Vicki's interactions with the healthcare system sort of represented the worst that we can possibly be um, in terms of how we treat people and how we depersonalize people. Just incredible. Um, so, and, and Vicki filmed this. She filmed her um, scenes when she's called the insurance company when her wheelchair is broken. Um, she films herself on hold for 45 minutes. And, uh, and so the, the next three scenes all relate to her wheelchair, but they all relate to how the society treats her and how, um, if you ask her retrospectively to talk about what she filmed and her experiences, she minimizes them a little bit. Um, or she remembers them in a way that doesn't show the dimension of what she does. So the first scene I'm going to show you in uh, about a year into filming, her wheelchair started to stop and stall on her. Now, she had a promobile, which is, or has a promobile, which is sort of like, um, uh, I don't know, the Porsche of the power wheelchairs. They're very expensive. They're $30,000. They're made by a Swiss manufacturer. And if you need a power wheelchair, it's kind of the one that you want to have. But um, Medicare doesn't necessarily, um, they only pay for a new one every six years, and even that is haphazard. So her wheelchair had been really giving her, had been stalling out in the street, um, and of course um, her primary care physician was the one who needed to authorize the repairs. There was a delay in authorization of the repairs. And then one Memorial Day weekend, um, Vicki's wheelchair um, stalled so that uh, the leg lifts that allowed her to lift her legs up and down um, broke. And as a result, um, there were serrated edges along the leg lifts, and so uh, her legs kept 
falling off to the side and she developed some pretty serious abrasions on both legs. She did not want to go to the emergency room. You can see why she didn't want to go. So that following day, this is, this is in the film, but this is a, a, a lead up to the scene. She went to her physician, which is in the film, um, and uh, he basically felt that she would be best served by going to a convalescent home for IV antibiotics and care. Uh, so she, they put her in a van and they send her to the convalescent home. And uh, by law, um, in California, you, uh, the convalescent, the, the paratransit driver doesn't have to take you inside. So they, so this is Vicky, and this is, the reason I'm showing you this clip is that the power of what happens when you give someone a, a video camera some, sometimes can be incredible. So Vicky is outside the nursing home trying to get in with her legs. You, you won't see her, I don't think, in this scene. Well, we're at the convalescent home now, but now we're going to have to have somebody open the door because the doors aren't open. And I dropped all my money, and so I'll have to have pick my money up. Evidently, they don't have anybody helping, so I don't know if I'm recording or not. Good about helping. No. Did you just come in by yourself? Yeah, because nobody would come open the door. Oh, I can hear the door, Hannah. What are you looking for? I'm supposed to be checking in. What about checking in? What is your name? Vicki Ullman. I love the welcome sign. Mm -hmm. So let's just move on. Um, so uh, she's now in the nursing home, and uh, this is three days later. She's in a room with four people, and uh, this is incredible. Get on that and get on the toilet. What are you going to do, number two? Well, I hope so. Well, you, you can uh, use the bed bed or do it in your diaper. And I will clean you up. It's not easy to do that. Well, that's not very easy. Huh? It's not easy. And it's not easy to put you, put you there, put you back. Vicky spent four weeks in the nursing home waiting for her wheelchair to get repaired. They took her camera away um, mm. about a week after she filmed that scene, uh, citing uh, uh, patient privacy. Um, <laughs> Provider privacy. Right, right. Mm. So it just, um, so I want to close with the last scene. Um, we got her out of the nursing home after a month um, uh, and got her back home, and about a month a month later, um, she had gone to a function, had come back. Um, she used this paratransit to get around in Los Angeles, and her wheelchair stalled again in the paratransit van. And, um, and uh, she didn't film that. And that's one thing that, um, it, that's one aspect if you give a, a client or a participant a camera, you can't say, well, you know, would, could you have, maybe it would have been better if you'd filmed when you're wheelchair stalled in the van. Um, Vicki often waited to sort of film in moments of kind of great, great sort of extreme. So she's uh, outside her house. She's 10 foot from her front door um, and she turns the camera on. She's, her wheelchair stalled. This is the last sequence. <laughs> the access driver 
just dropped me off and I, 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 I was inside my house because I, I can't, can't get inside. I was going to call 911, but my cell phone doesn't have a signal there, so I can't, I can't call anybody either, so I'm just stuck here. Well, I'm... I'm still here, and I guess maybe I'll be spending the night out here. But, um, cause nobody is driving by. I guess everybody's in already or out on dates or something. <laughs> it's getting dark, so maybe I'll end up spending the night out here. I guess other than being a, a little c c c cold, it, 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 it will be okay. <laughs> She was outside for two hours. Um, I'll turn the lights on. That's the last scene. Um, there's always an inherent shock. I've seen that scene now probably, I don't know, maybe a hundred times or maybe more, and every time I watch it, it's just enraging. Mm -hmm. Just enraging. Um, and it's for a couple of reasons, one of which it shows you what the camera can do. Um, uh, you know, you watch it, it's getting dark, and it's this sort of moment that normally, for the most part, Vicky is invisible in this world. You know, she's a disabled person. We would never see her. We would never know about her experiences. She never talks about these experiences to her doctor. And yet, um, sort of, these are little moments that happen to her, and I would like to say they're the exception to the rule, but they're not. Um, and uh, also, you sort of get a sense of the texture of the, of the image. Um, you know, she starts out, she's hysterical. You know, she's crying. Then she's trying, you know, she tries to call 911. She tries to see if she can sort of solve the problem herself. She doesn't have a cell phone signal. And then, and then over time, basically, it gets darker, and you sort of see her acquiesce. You know, she sort of gives up. Um, or at least sort of tries to make do with the current sort of circumstances that are sort of always changing around her. So she waited, and then neighbor drove by, and... Um, brought her inside. The paratransit driver was long gone. Um, and uh, when we showed this to the paratransit community in Los Angeles, their response was, um, uh, you know, by law, we don't have to take her inside the house. And she should have had, you know, a better repaired wheelchair. So um, these are just examples of um, footage that I had no idea that these three people were going to film this when I gave them a video camera. I sort of thought that, you know, I had read a lot in the disability literature, a lot of the memoirs. I sort of thought I knew what they were going to film, and then mm -hmm. it was a complete surprise to all of us. Um, and then the next question was, well, do I present these in truncated versions and write about them in a paper, which is what my world would like for me to do, um, or do you try to put this into something else? So what I did um, collaboratively with the participants was then over another two years, take the 212 hours and cut it into a documentary. And we did that iteratively over time. We did 212 hours, and then we did six hours, and then we did three hours, and then we did an hour and a half. And so we would go into the editing room with my editor, look at materials that the participants thought was important and that we thought was important, and then sort of iteratively cut it into a piece. And if you watch the film, it's clear they're very different people, very different life experiences, and so those are parts of their life, and then there are arcs that each of them have that sort of relate to the disability experience. Mm -hmm. So... We didn't think it was going to be a film. We made it into a film. It had a run in the festivals. Um, and then uh, we um, cut a shorter version of it for PBS this last year. Um, and, uh, and we built a website. Uh, the film is on the web. It's available. It's for free. Um, you can watch it online. Um, uh, if you are hard of hearing, it's closed captioned, so you can watch it online. Um, we also took kind of a different approach in terms of distribution. We didn't sell it to a distributor, partly because distributors tend to charge at least $50 or $20 for a film, and two-thirds of the disabled um, uh, citizens in the United States live in poverty, and uh, we got too many letters from people who couldn't afford that, so we've been giving it away. 
Um, and as a result, it's sort of taken on this sort of grassroots life of its own in ways that we had not ever remotely dreamed of. We all went to One Ber World Berlin, Vicky and Galen and I all traveled to Germany and showed the film there. What was striking was that after the film screened, uh, uh, a large group of individuals went up to Vicky and didn't want her to go back home. Mm -hmm. It was incredible, just incredible, mm -hmm. um, particularly in Germany, which sort of historically didn't treat the disabled that well. Um, and uh, we've had, um, so each of the participants has been asked to, to, because of the film, communities have reached out to them in ways that we hadn't expected. Um, and then PBS stations around the country have been um, holding outreach um, uh, sessions with um, communities that we hadn't expected. So as an example, there are, there's a group of nursing home residents in New Hampshire who have 20 copies of the film who actively show it to their caregivers at the mm -hmm. nursing home on a regular basis just to make sure that they're not treated the way Vicky is. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one thing that a film can do. You, it can, unlike a paper, it has the ability to empower other groups depending on how they choose to use it. The Boy Scouts in Nashville, um, there's a disability badge that they had to fulfill. So the Boy Scouts of Tennessee watched Rolling, and then they went into their community and looked for things in their community that they can structurally potentially change. They then took their assignments and had them at the Adventure Science Center in Nashville. Who would have thought? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would, never would have thought that Boy Scouts would be using this film. So J.P. Morgan, if it's still around, um, is using the film for ability awareness training for their employees. So it's sort of reached um, communities in ways I don't think any of us had ever imagined. Um, and I think that's one, one aspect of the power of the visual medium, if used properly. So I think I'm going to stop talking and take questions or comments well, from people. We'll yeah. Sure. Hello, and thank you so much, Gretchen. It's really a distinct honor to be given the chance to comment briefly on the work of a woman who's really a renegade in the world of medicine, and I mean that in the best sense of the word. She's pushing the boundaries of our field, and I think it will be to the benefit of people and patients everywhere, so thank you. In rolling, Gretchen calls on us as an audience to attend to the realities of human lives lived in wheelchairs. And watching, as you now know, is not a comfortable process. We're transported into lives that contain varying degrees of suffering and loss. We also bear witness to, to triumph. But it was not by any means comfortable to watch just now as Vicki Elman was stranded outside her home because a driver would not or could not help her. It was painful in other scenes to watch her stranded on her bedroom floor and unable to get back into her bed, even as it was encouraging to see her neighbors who helped her. They were good natured and they wanted to literally and figuratively lift her up and, re and relieve her plight. These struggles are often intensely private affairs. Some of you may know about disabilities firsthand. You may face your own challenges, physical or psychological. You may be in pain. And this is not obvious to me standing here and looking at you. Chances are your colleagues and I have very little idea what it took for you to come in to work today. Enrolling, Gretchen has taken what is often invisible, and she's made it visible. She's borne witness to what we in our field call the disablement process. Rolling shines the light of day on what is otherwise left unseen except to disabled people themselves or their caregivers. To the able-bodied and healthy among us, the invisibility of disabled people and their life challenges is a kind of perhaps undeserved comfort. It's a dose of blissful ignorance. To people in wheelchairs, and their loved ones, that invisibility is insidious and socially isolating. So in her work, Dr. Berland accomplishes a great deal for several different audiences. She provides something of real social value by giving cameras to people in wheelchairs and by giving them voice. First, I think for an audience of people who have firsthand experience, uh, if you or a loved one has lived with a disability or debilitating illness, the film probably really resonates for you. It's likely that you feel seen and heard, and you have in this documentary a bridge 
to other people like you, and you also have a tool for communicating to people unlike you uh, things that they just otherwise wouldn't understand. Rolling gives images and voice to experiences that are close to home for you if you're in this group. The second gift of rolling is to people for whom the world of disability and illness are thankfully foreign territory. If you count yourself in this group, rolling lets you into a sphere that you do not inhabit, and it challenges you to see in a new way. Before rolling, I, for one, hadn't considered the problems that a broken wheelchair would create. I hadn't thought about the fact that a chair unfixable for four weeks would result in a, in a stay in a convalescent home, which is itself, as you saw, a sickening process, literally and figura figuratively. When struggles like these remain private, they're immune to inspection. Left unseen, injustices are likely to persist. Rowling gives another gift for a different audience, a glimpse of what may, for some of us, be in our future. Though we, who are hale and hearty, are loath to admit it, half of us are likely to have some form of disability at some point in our lives. And the overwhelming majority of us will care for a disabled or loved one at some point. What rolling does is it lets us into that world in a direct but comparatively gentle way before life throws us wholesale into it. Galen, uh, who you saw in the film, has commented on the steps that we as human beings take to protect ourselves from the reality of the lives of people with disabilities. We actively exclude people in wheelchairs or people who are otherwise disabled or different. And I think, in fact, some of my comments can refer to differences across socioeconomic status or race as well. We exclude these people from our line of sight. When we pass a person on the street who's in a wheelchair, we may look straight above them into the space above their heads, avoiding making eye contact. And eye contact, of course, is one way, a fairly important step in acknowledging a human being's existence. So this failure to make eye contact has a formal term, gaze, G-A-Z-E, avoidance. You saw it, you may have seen it in some of the clips in Rolling. I've committed it on Locust Walk when I've passed a student who's struggling on crutches across the cobblestone walk. I did it when I stood online next to a man who had a marked facial deformity. I committed gaze avoidance. I was aware of that feeling of awkwardness and I committed gaze avoidance. But inspired by Gretchen's work, I'd like to invoke this phenomenon of gaze avoidance as a metaphor for some of the challenges of my home field, which is epidemiology and public health. I hope that these observations will also resonate for those of you who are legal advocates. Now, I can, I can do this for you using just a few images from work that we've done here at the University of Pennsylvania and the Health of Philadelphia Photo Documentation Project, uh, where we engaged local residents as well as professional photographers, focusing on three Philadelphia neighborhoods predominantly that represent a steep social class gradient within like a three mile distance from center city, an area of re relative affluence where 10% of people live in poverty through Spring Garden uh, where there are moderate levels of poverty to north central Philadelphia where about half of the residents live in poverty. So I'll begin with this image which became emblematic for me. It was one of the first images or places that a resident of Philadelphia showed to us. And what you're looking at here is a weed growing out of a third story window. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we have the dubious distinction in Philadelphia of having the um, greatest concentration of abandoned homes and businesses of any city in the country. Uh, this, I think, is the social up upshot of large scale gaze avoidance, of not looking. What this participant said to us is, I can't believe that this building has been standing empty for so long that the weeds are growing out of the third story window. How can we let this happen? Th this abandoned building has been neglected for so long that the weeds are almost as high as the roof and it's not clear what will come down first, the roof or the weeds. In terms of public health in urban America and here in Philadelphia's disadvantaged neighborhoods, we've averted our gaze. We've uh, abdicated responsibility in some ways, and we have these proverbial weeds growing in our gardens. We're a national leader in infant mortality, gun violence, homicide, 
A baby born in north central Philadelphia, for example, is more than 20 times as likely to die within the first year of life as a baby born in center city three miles away. So we have to ask ourselves as public health, I, I, as an advocate of public health, how can we let that happen in such a small area and how can we stand by and really not look? And in public health, part of the reason is a, a dirty secret that we have in our field, which is that though the field is called public health, we don't often venture out into the public and in law this may uh, operate too. Uh, we often train and practice far from any public sphere, but we have to have some strategies, and I would argue today that visual methods are a strategy for looking straight into these daunting problems in order to identify solutions. So I want to offer you a very simple example that relates to health and to uh, the importance of engaging local residents in understanding the health of a place. So the images that I'm going to run through in this fast Philly food tour um, begin with Center City and an inviting cafe in my own neighborhood, uh, the Reading Terminal Market, a place of abundance where you can see locals and tourists mingling, happily eating very well. Um, the local supermarket, uh, again, a very inviting place, and a cafe where uh, people can sit right on the street and enjoy. I think you can see that we've quickly crossed a line and life is different in this neighborhood. And as I continue, you'll see one of the ubiquitous elements of the food environment in Philadelphia's more disadvantaged neighborhoods is that alcohol and food or cigarettes and food are often uh, going hand in hand. And the food options are much more restricted. This came to our attention in particular because if you drive in some of Philadelphia's poorer neighborhoods, you see a real abundance of Chinese takeout restaurants. And I, as a public health researcher, look at this and I say, okay, we need to count these places and understand, you know, high fat food, high salt food, high sugar food. This is very straightforward, you know, it's unhealthy, but it's kind of appealing. And if it's the only thing you have to eat, you're gonna eat it. Bad for your health, though. We see fast food in public health and we think obesity, hypertension, diabetes. But then we listen to participants because they repeatedly brought to us these pictures of Asian takeout restaurants. And we said, you know, how does this influence your health that these are some of the primary food sources in neighborhoods that don't have supermarkets? And I'll let this participant explain to you. Another incident that really made me I mean, really made me mad. Um, I w was I went to a store, and it's a, it's a block away from my home. And I was going it's a Chinese store, and I was going to get Chinese food, um, shrimp fried rice. And normally, I'm, I say I'm not getting shrimp fried rice from any of these stores. If I get shrimp fried rice, I'm going to get it from Chinatown, you know. So I, I really don't patronize the neighborhood stores. So, um, like I had, that's all we did when we grew up. You if you needed something, you went to a neighborhood store. And so I says, okay, I'm going to go get some shrimp fried rice. So I go ahead to get the shrimp fried rice. And I ask for it, and he says, we don't have any rice. So, you don't have any rice? Yo. I said, well, where's your menu? We don't have any menu. And I looked in the kitchen, and it was just as clean as anything. It was unused. It, they don't serve food. It, it's and that's one of the things I wanted to take because it's pictures I wanted to take because it's so upsetting to me. But it has all this malt liquor and beers and cigarettes and um, paraphernalia for, um, you know, illegal drugs in the store. But there's, and they have this big marquee, you know, the Chinese food. And they don't sell any foods, no Chinese. They didn't have any rights. You're a Chinese store, you don't have rice. And that was very upsetting to me. And it's still to this day, it's very upsetting to me that they would do that, that they would do that. Okay, so here you've heard that what looks like a Chinese restaurant is in fact not a place where you can get food at all, but you can get alcohol, cigarettes, drug paraphernalia. And this wasn't an isolated story. We heard again and again from residents of disadvantaged neighborhoods that 
Takeout restaurants were actually standing in as places where alcohol and sing single cigarettes could be purchased. And we also heard residents talk about these places as an engine for violence with people loitering and getting their alcohol or potentially drug deals going on in the vicinity of these uh, takeout restaurants. So we also heard about pal palpable, intense race ethnic tensions between the predominantly African American residents of neighborhoods and the predominantly Asian shop owners. And it seemed like the tension went both ways. Patrons felt belittled and scorned by proprietors who gave them short change, who failed to give them a bag for their purchases, who made them stand on what they saw as the wrong side of bulletproof glass inside these shops. The glass to them said, you stay out there and get shot up. I'm not having any contact with you. It also says the shopkeepers are quite afraid. So this economic exchange is unbalanced with winners and losers on opposite sides of that bulletproof glass. So this is one brief example, and Gretchen has given you very compelling examples that answer the question, why use cameras? Well, cameras provide very solid evidence. I would say they don't lie, although I think we can make them lie. <laughs> so we can talk about that. But cameras are also accessible. And holding a camera is in some ways a license to be there observing with new eyes and listening. So why engage citizens as photographers or videographers as Gretchen did in Rowling? I think because there's a difference between bearing witness and being voyeuristic. And engaging citizens as photographers or videographers lets people have the power to decide where to turn the lens and what, what parts of their own story to tell. Thank you. So I think we'll take questions now.